everyone, and welcome to Tableau on Tableau for HR. I'm Kylie Alfano, Tableau's Director of HR Operations. Some of you may know me from previous conferences. For those of you who don't, I've been at Tableau for five and a half years now, and I oversee compensation, benefits, mobility, as well as analytics for both the HR and recruiting teams. Prior to Tableau, I came from finance, so I love numbers and data, and I love being able to use our product every day to understand our people better. Our product continues to open my eyes to new insights about them. Today's presentation builds on the 101 and 201 presentations, as well as one new topic. With each of the stories, I'm gonna share those insights and the opportunities that come from each one of them. Here are the five stories that I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna start with training, which is a new topic that I've not talked about before. I'm then gonna talk about attrition and retention. I've talked about attrition before, but I'm gonna show a new metric that we're looking at, as well as how we're looking at the inverse, which is retention. I'm next gonna talk about performance ratings and show the evolution of a dashboard over the last three years and the improvements that we continue to make on that one dashboard. I'm then gonna share a compensation story and I pulled in this story due to a recent experience that I went through over the last 30 days that actually wrapped up the Friday before coming to conference. And I'm gonna share how I took five different dashboards, consolidated them down to three that allowed for much quicker decisions. And the last story is around our organizational structure and how we've gone from a very narrow view of that pyramid to now looking at the full org structure in Tableau. We will save time at the end for Q&A, so write down any questions that you have. And there is no need to fact check any of the dashboards that I share. It's all fake data, fake numbers. So don't pay attention to them. Pay attention to the concepts, the insights, the questions um, that come from each one of them. You guys all know how sensitive HR data is. So um, don't pay attention to those parts. Um, I would also like to point out that today's presentation is in StoryPoints. So if you're not feel familiar with it, um, this is in our product. And the dashboards that I share will be interactive. Let's get started. So the first story is training. And with this one, I have not talked about it before and I get questions from the people wondering how we're looking at it, what, mat what metrics we're tracking, what do our dashboards look like? And the reality of it is we were not looking at our training metrics in Tableau prior to this year. So we don't have an LMS, so we were tracking all of the data in Excel spreadsheets. And those Excel spreadsheets varied by region and varied in their format, as well as what we were tracking. So we were able to answer very basic questions like, how many people have attended Leadership 101? But when asked that next level of data, like, well, what percent of the population does that represent? We weren't able to answer that. So the first step was cleaning the data and getting it into a format that Tableau could digest. And so with that, we use Tableau Prep to clean the data. And I'm gonna quickly show you that workflow for those of you who might not be familiar with this product. How many people have used Tableau Prep so far? Okay, it looks like about a third of you have. So here's what Tableau Prep looks like. Um, the first step, similar to what you would do in Tableau, would be to connect to your data. So like Tableau, you hit that plus button and you're able to pull in any sort of data that you want. But what I love about this product is this wildcard union feature. So with this, I was able to point Tableau Prep to a folder and I was able to pull in all the spreadsheets that contained training data. So where this is helpful is it knows that if I add a new spreadsheet, it's gonna to know to pull it in, or if I change a name or tweak something, it's gonna to continue to pull in those additional spreadsheets. So it's really easy to make sure that I have all the spreadsheets pulling into this data. From here, you can see what that looks like. And then I was easily able to clean that data. So I was able to remove some fields, merge some fields, rename fields, in order to get the data into a clean format. So with this, we were able to switch, or swap names where they were last first or first last. We were able to break names. We were kind of able to do all the cleaning that we needed to, to be able to create a consistent format. I once again was able to do one more calculation here 
And then in order to answer that next level of detail, I needed to pull in additional employee data. So I added another connection to a single table, which had those other fields that I wanted to be able to pull in, like cost center, manager name, et cetera. So I pulled that in, I join it, and I'm able to see those different join types really easily in prep to see you know, what's included, what's excluded. I once again needed to do one quick um, cleaning of removing employee name, because now I have two columns of it. But you can see here, the way this is laid out is with each class type, it created a different column, and with each date of each class, it also created another column, which Tableau wasn't able to digest, so I needed to do a pivot. So I pivoted on class type, so now I have one column that contains all the different class names, but then I needed to do that second pivot. And you guys know with desktop you can do one pivot, but really being able to do multiple pivots was key to get the data into a format that we needed. So my second pivot was on date, and then I was able to create that output file. But one tip that I always do when using prep is before I create that output file, I always right click and preview in desktop just to make sure that the data is in the format that I want, that all the fields are clean. Um, so that's just a trick that I always like to incorporate. So that I'm able to create that output file, and from that output file, I can start to build dashboards. So back into the story. So once we created, or once we got the data into a format, um, I'm gonna share three dashboard examples. The first one is the high level overview. So this is used by our training manager to understand how many classes in total have been taken, how that breaks down by class type, how that breaks down by business unit, some trending over time, as well as that percent of attendance by class type and cost center. So this provides that high level overview for him to understand um, how many people and what percent does that represent. I've noticed that a few of you have pulled out your cameras to take pictures, that's totally fine, but this presentation will also be available after um, through the sessions breakout um, section of the web. So if you don't wanna take pictures, um, you don't have to, it will be available, both the PDF as well as the workbook. So you can see here we've added filters, so if you were to click on career development, for example, you can see that that filters down. You can see that when we see something like operations where only 5.8% have taken it, you know, our training manager could reach out to the operations um, leaders to kind of get more people involved taking the classes. Maybe we need to offer a special class for the operations team if that's important to those leaders. So this was that high level overview that we created. In addition, budget's something that we always like to track. So we were able to pull in data from finance. Once again, blend it with those class types, attendance, number of classes to be able to understand what we're spending by class type, how that breaks down by department and by region. You can see here we can track our cost over time as well as add in a forecast where we can look at what classes do we have upcoming throughout the rest of the year, blend that in with the average cl class cost to create a forecast for what we anticipate spending throughout the rest of the year. And you can see we have that up here where we can see kind of where we're at um, from an overall spend perspective. So this was just another perspective that we built and another tool for our training manager to use. But as we were going through building these, something kept coming into my mind, which was, you know, I have a team of people and I had no idea what classes people on my team had taken and when was the last time they had taken a class. And so this third dashboard is a tool for managers to use to be able to answer that question. So with these dashboards, not only are we creating dashboards that are useful for our own internal HR team, but we're also creating a tool for managers to use. So here, you know, if you were the admin, you could see everyone, but we applied user-based security so that if you know, Abigail, for example, logged in, she would only see the people for her team and she'd be able to see how many classes they had taken and then those days. So she can use this as a tool to be able to have conversations with her people to make sure that they're continuing to learn, take classes, and maybe take classes that they haven't taken before to make sure that they're continuing their education. This next story is around attrition and retention. 
And like I said, we've been tracking attrition and I built this dashboard when I joined Tableau five years ago and it's one that we still use today. So this is the highest level view that we're looking at where we're looking at our turnover over the past five years. And the way we calculate the year-to-date turnover is the numerator is the year-to-date terms. So as the year progresses, that numerator grows as more people leave, and the denominator is the average headcount balance. So you can see here on the left, when we're looking at overall for the company, if we were to be in March of 2018, you can see that that year-to-date turnover is 6% or higher than the previous four years. So you might you know, ask the question of why, and what you can see is by department, you know, it looks like sales might be contributing to this overall trend. And then you can also look by region to say, you know, is it based off of one region or not, or is it maybe spread throughout all of them? So this provides that highest level overview for our leaders to understand how our turnover is tracking compared to previous years. And when we see an uptick, like here for example, we would dig into additional dashboards like this one where we're looking at our monthly turnover rate and how that breaks down by voluntary versus involuntary. So you can see here, it's likely due to this uptick here in the beginning part of this year for why turnover is higher. And from here, you could dig into term themes, um, reasons, et cetera, to be able to understand what is going on. But what we discovered this year was all of our turnover dashboards focused on kind of point in time metrics and we weren't doing any rolling averages. So in addition to looking at these, we started pulling in trailing 12-month turnover rates. And this normalizes any of those kind of spikes in our numbers to provide a different view. And at one point, we actually tried to kill some of those other examples, but what we found was they actually tell different stories. So a lot of times, this is used, but it, might, it lags any sort of spike. So if you had a spike in March of a year, this might, wouldn't necessarily reflect that. So it's really helpful to look at both because they both give different insights. And with this, we're looking at not just the trailing 12 months, but we're also looking at it from a regrettable, unregrettable perspective as well. And then we primarily use this in all of our forecasting models for turnover, hiring, recruiting, planning, et cetera. So that's how we're using this in addition to those other ones. And then in addition to looking at attrition, we've started looking at the inverse, which is retention. So if you notice here in this example, we ended December of 17 at a turnover rate of 14.9%. So then when we flip that to start looking at retention, you'll notice that that ties in with this 85.1 here. And so this is our retention summary. And you can see we have a goal here of 85%, but you could change that goal Instead of a goal, maybe you would make this reference line an average. And then you can see really quickly in this bottom graph how you're doing compared to that goal or that average. And so what this does by publishing it is it changes the mindset of the person digesting this information. As an, and as opposed to always thinking historically in terms of who's left, why have they left, this switches it to who am I retaining and how do I retain them and how do I make sure I'm retaining the people that are you know, really important to Tableau. So in order to kind of come up with that retention strategy, it's first important to understand why are people leaving. So this is an example of looking at turnover reason across performance score, tenure, promotion, and kind of any of the other variables that you would want to look at. And so like I said, this is fake data. So this story is fake. But I picked the story because it probably will resonate with stuff that you have gone through um, in your HR career. But the story and the storyline here is that we saw people leaving for career advancement. And as I hover over them, I've made this data so that it hovers over people that are high performers who have been here for kind of two to three years and have not been promoted in a while. So they're likely leaving for that next level they're top performers, you know, they're doing well in their career, but they feel that they need to leave Tableau for that next step. So we're gonna play on that story for these next couple dashboards. So you can see here I've created a scatter plot where I'm looking at people that have not been promoted in the last year, so they fall above this line. 
And then tenure also, so I've set this tenure line to be people who have been here to the left less than a year and a half and to the right more than a year and a half. And as I hover over these dots, you can see they highlight people below. So here's an employee who's been here for over five years, a top performer, and who also has not been promoted in the last two and a half to three years. So you can start to explore your data and tie together these different variables to try to understand maybe why people are leaving and, and if there's a common theme here. But with any dashboard, I think it's important to build out different perspectives. So sometimes I create a scatter plot like this and there's a lot of dots and sometimes it's hard to explore and understand what's going on. So I always think it's important, especially when you're exploring your data, to build out multiple perspectives up front. So here's another view of that similar scatter plot view where we're looking at by performance rating, who's active versus left, and then breaking that down below by time since their last promotion, so that's the y-axis, across the performance rating scale, and across term versus active. So here, what pops is, you know, for one, so these are people not performing, you can see that most have left, you only have one active, and that for the top performers here, so the fives, you can say here are the people that have left, so these were those dots that were in that far upper right portion of the scatter plot in the previous dashboard. But you can also see here, here are those active ones that, you know, maybe they're on the fence of leaving, maybe they're people that you'd want to focus that retention strategy towards. And then what you can do is once you start identifying these variables and start thinking about them, you can apply them to your current population. So our two hypotheses are one, high performing people who have not been promoted recently are more likely to leave. So if that's your hypothesis, you could then apply that to your current population and see how many people fall under those variables. So here you can see you have 112 people in that category. And down below, you can see if your second hypothesis is high performing people who have long tenure are more likely to leave. You can see as I hover over here, you can see you have 202 people in that category. And then, like always, you can always make your dashboards better. So this final example just takes those multiple dashboards and creates one that's interactive. So now we have parameters for the X and Y axis. So you can see here this scenario where we're looking at performance score across days since last promotion populates this four box above, and you can see how many people fall under each. But as I change it, we'll keep PA score for the Y axis and then maybe we'll do days since last promotion here, you can see that it updates. So as you bring in different variables and more variables into this model, you create a really interactive dashboard so that when you sit down with leaders and have those conversations for their team, you're able to switch those variables, change that conversation, and have a live kind of interactive model for them to play around with and also explore the data. This next story is around our performance rating dashboard and the evolution that we've gone through over the last three years. So this first dashboard pulls from my 101 presentation. And this is where we started three years ago. So we pulled in score distribution across the company and we broke that down by department. At Tableau, we don't have force distribution, but we like to ensure that there's consistency across the different teams. And so when a leader would ask me, what's the score distribution, I would take a snapshot or a picture of their team, so maybe I would take a snapshot of development and I would email it to them. So that was great, that answered that question, but I was frequently getting that next question which was, well, how do I compare? And so in year one, I would then take a snapshot of the overall company and also email it. Not ideal, but it worked. Um, it was simple, it worked, um, but then next year, we thought about those common questions and we added in reference lines. So in this case, you can see real quickly what that reference line is for the average company so that when they received the image, they were able to quickly see how they compared. So a simple update yet eliminated that question and that need to go back and forth, which saved both of us time. In addition to this, we were able to set reference lines at different levels. So this is an example of looking at one layer deeper, so one layer below sales, 
and we could set reference lines for both the business unit as well as the overall company, and we a lot of times included both. So that was helpful. But when we shared this data, we included just this data in the tooltip, which showed the number of people and the percent. And so that next question was, well, who are those people? And our answer was, here's how to run the report and workday to see that underlying data, which worked. They were able to see who those people were, but it was not the best experience for them. And so the evolution is that due to prep, we're able to now share that underlying data securely with them. And one of the reasons why we weren't able to is how the hierarchy was set up in Workday so that when we run a report, you can see, for example, um, we have multiple levels of the organization and that management chain as we get further down in the org. So in this example, we have three levels of management. Ashley, who is the employee in the top row, also happens to be the CEO in this example. So she doesn't have another manager. And that you can see Bobby reports into Ashley, Kate reports into Ashley, but Danny reports into Bobby who rolls into Ashley. So you can see those, those different layers. So applying user-based security and making sure that Ashley can see everyone, but Bobby can only see Danny, um, but Ashley can see Bobby and Danny was a challenge before. And I'm sure we could have written a complicated calculation, but really quickly in prep, we were able to change the data and create a workflow that allows us to be able to share that data securely. And um, I'm gonna share this just because it's simple. It once again is a great use case for prep. Um, and I, the way our hierarchy is set up is probably similar to the way it is set up with most HRIS systems. So you might wanna copy this workflow if you're going through a similar challenge. Um, so the first thing with pulling in that data, once again, due to the multiple columns of managers, we wanna pivot that data. We then aggregated the data, rejoined it with the employee name here. So we did an inner join. Removed one column because we now had the original employee in two columns. And what you can see is that this employee with access, so in the first case, Ashley, she can see everyone. But Bobby can't see his peer who is Kate in this example. Kate can't see anyone. Danny can see Frank. And then you could add one more field where if employee equals employee with access, you would eliminate them so they can't see their own PA score. But really quickly, we were able to make sure that not just um, leaders could see just who reports to them, but they could see the layers further down as well. So then once we created that workflow, we now have a dashboard. So we're in year three of this evolution where as we hover over these bars, you can see who the people are. So in this example, you can see I'm logged in in the bottom here as myself. So these would be the people under my teams if I were to oversee technical operations, which I don't. So you can see I have two people who have a score of one, and I have seven people with a score of four. But for example, and I'm gonna do this for illustrative purposes, I report into Michelle Yetman. You can see that if Michelle were to log in and see the data, one, another cost center appeared, so she oversees more than just tech ops, and that as she hovers over these lines, she can see, remember I had seven people who were, who were in this category, now there's eight, so she's able to see that next level of detail as well. So through prep and through server, we are able to provide that next level of detail to the people that we support, which provides really quick answers for them, a better experience, and allows them to make faster decisions. So like with most of these dashboards, they've evolved over time. I always say using Tableau is a journey. So depending on where you're at in that journey, um, I encourage you to keep kind of thinking about those questions and trying to figure out how you can incorporate those answers into your dashboards. This next story is around compensation. And so over the last month, I had to update all of our 2019 sales ranges, which we have a lot of different jobs across a lot of different countries and currencies. So I was not only constrained from a timing perspective, 
but I was also constrained from a resource perspective. So I was down a key person on my team who normally would have taken the lead on this project. So I had to think through how I updated dashboards in order to lead to a faster decisions. And so I did a few things that I thought were really helpful that allowed me to hit that deadline that I'm gonna share in this story. So this first example is around percent in range. So this is a dashboard that we had before that helped us understand where our current people fall relative to the compensation range. And the way we calculate it at Tableau is if someone's at the bottom of the range, they're at the zero percentile, and if they're at the top end of the range, they're at 100. So anything to the left of zero, they're under. Anything to the right, they're over. So you can see here that where people fall relative to range, are we using the full range, um, how does that work? But normally I would have just stopped here and shared the example to kind of set the context for that conversation. But what I did here was I thought of another dashboard where I'd, all I did was updated the tooltip to be able to pull in what are those ranges. Because what I found a lot of times was they would say, well, who are these people? And I'd have to flip to another dashboard to be able to answer that question. But what I did was I just added in that dashboard or that um, spreadsheet to here so that that tooltip became smart. So now I could quickly hover over, give them context, and give them that next level of detail. And then you can see I did that same thing across region below. So in this case, I combined those two dashboards into one, led to better decisions, led to faster results, and then also um, really helped set the stage quicker. And then from here, we went one layer deeper where we decided that we wanted to only focus on the roles where most of the hires had come in either below or above. So we added what we called indicators, which allowed us to focus on just the 2018 hires, so we did this based off of hire date, and then just the roles that we called red, which were where hires were brought in below or above. And so by adding these two indicators, it seems really simple, but in previous years we would have scrolled through all of the jobs across all the regions and talked about all of them, and, wasted, and we found we wasted too much time on roles where we didn't really need to focus our attention. So by adding these two indicators, the number of jobs shrank significantly and we were able to have more impactful, meaningful conversations around the roles where we really needed to spend time digging into the data. So in this case, we were able to add those two indicators, the number of jobs decreased, and then in addition to that, it didn't just stop there, but we were able to add in once again a smart tooltip which was at the employee level, so we could actually start digging into and understanding who were those employees. So in this case, once again, before I'd always have a second dashboard with that data, but in here, by just pulling it in here, eliminated and saved time between toggling between those dashboards. That next level of review that we needed to go through was once we had identified those roles where we had hired people below or above, the next question was, well, where's the market data? And you know, was it a result of either setting the comp band too high or setting the compensation band too low? So in this example, we've looked at all of our roles um, and we've built the parameters to be around the 25th to the 75th percentile. You could set this based off of you know, the 10th to the 90th. Maybe you peg off of the 50th percentile and do 20% above or below. Um, but what we wanted to do was set kind of a four box summary where we're looking at, in the bottom left, those are the roles where both the max is below as well as the min is below. And then the upper right would be where the, our range is broader than the market. The bottom left is narrower than the market and the top is where both are above market. So in this case, you can quickly see where those roles were, were below, but then it doesn't just stop there. Once again, with good tool tips, we were able to drill in and add a next layer of detail where we're able to look at who are the people and what are those roles. And we have it here where you can see this is fake data, like you can tell here, but the green data is our range relative to the market, which is that other shaded band. So we were able to quickly see what are those roles, how far are we off, um, and what do we need to do. And then here's just another example where we break it down one level deeper, which is not on the role level, but also on the employee level, um, to see who those employees were and how many people fall under each one of those categories. So you can see those 120 plus jobs equate to about 357 people here. Um, so the point of this story was, 
if you think about a process or a dashboard that might be complex, sometimes we tend to build these really complex, comp complicated dashboards. Sometimes it's hard for the people that are reviewing them to understand and to really figure out what they need to focus on. So I encourage you all to think about what are those key indicators and how can you add those in order for them to know what they should be focusing their time on. And the final story that I'm gonna cover is around our organizational hierarchy. So like I said, for the past couple years, we've been looking at our org structure, but just at the bottom of the pyramid, so the number of direct reports for each manager. So this is a dashboard that I've shared before, and this is one that we created a few years ago for our business partners to use. So they asked us if we would create a dashboard to help them understand for the teams that they supported across their managers how many direct reports each one of them had. So you can see here, if you supported marketing, you, know, you would look at this, and Tommy Heath would probably flag. Um, he stands out as an outlier where he has 14 direct reports. So in this case, the business partners use this to, to sit down with the leaders of the marketing team and understand what they need to do um, to make sure Tommy is set up for success, as well as making sure the people that he reports to are also set up for success whether that be shifting some of them to another manager, hiring someone under him, maybe he has a position that's open, that's taken a long time to fill, you know, what do we need to do to get that position filled? So the business partners use this, they found it really helpful, but this was a very narrow view of our org structure. So this next view takes that level of detail, so the manager to IC ratio, and then expands on that. So this top line shows that manager to IC ratio, and in this one, you know, development's one to 8.6, and the other groups are lower. Then we're looking at kind of the director and above percent for that business unit. And then we break it down by level here. So you can see that full perspective in this dashboard. And you know, in this case, development would flag in my mind for that ratio of individual contributor to manager. In marketing, for example, you know, maybe it's this director population that flags. In operations, to me, the VP flags at 7%, that's higher than in the other orgs. And for sales, it looks, you know, relatively easy, kind of what I would expect from a org structure perspective. So this can be used by our leaders to understand, do they need to hire people at uh, more senior levels? Do we need to promote people? Do we have the right ratios in place kind of across the full or levels. But like always, I think it's important to build out those multiple perspectives. So when I first created these dashboards, that first view that I showed you is kind of how I envisioned creating it with that pyramid structure. But this view takes that same data and breaks it down as a percent of total. And then we break it down below where we remove the individual contributors and look at it as just a percent of management headcount. So what I found here was different things popped in this dashboard that didn't necessarily pop in the dashboard before. So for example, you know, the ICs pop up above here for development. That was you know, that high ratio in the dashboard before. Um, but when I looked down below, what I didn't realize was when I looked at the sales org, it looked, nothing stood out. But when I look down here, I can see that overall management equates to 7.2% in sales which is you know, the second lowest. And so in this case, other metrics pop here that weren't before. So I think it's always important when building out dashboards to create different views before you land on that final one that you present. And maybe you always have multiple because it leads to those different insights. Different leaders also tend to gravitate towards different dashboards um, and are able to understand them differently. So. Create multiple dashboards, um, see what people get, see what people like um, before finalizing. So in summary, the five stories present five different opportunities for you guys to take back and apply um, to the dashboards that you have. So the first story was around training, which was a new topic for us. So the opportunity that I want you guys to think about is what dashboard do you currently, or what topic do you currently not use for Tableau for today? what dashboard could you build? The next story was how we turned our attrition metrics into retention metrics. And so I'd like you guys to all think of a metric that leads you to be reactive. 
How can you take a fresh look at your data to create a proactive solution? The next story was around our evolution of our performance rating dashboard and how we were able to make it better for our users. So I'd like you guys to all think about how you can add things into your dashboards that can provide that data at the user's fingertips, providing self-service for them. The next story was around compensation and what we did to create those faster dashboards and consolidate our dashboards. So I'd like you guys to all think about either a um, process or a dashboard that's time intensive. What key indicators can you add? And then the final one was around how we took a very single, narrow dashboard that had a single perspective, expanded it, and created those multiple perspectives. So the final opportunity for you guys is how can you add a new perspective to a dashboard that you already have in place? So I hope one or all these stories resonate with you guys and you're able to take back one of these questions um, to what you have already built and you're able and expand, build something new to um, learn new insights about your people. With that, we will open it up for Q&A. Any questions? We haven't done that exact ROI, but we have done, um, there's been a few others on the turnover front where we saw a high turnover and then we were able to track those results and kind of share those results back and you know make sure that what we were doing on the retention front was working. So we have done it in that way, but we have not quantified it. But a lot of times like with that example, we, we always track to make sure that it, it works and that that's really what was going on. So that's part of you know keeping that testing going. Yeah. Other questions this way? Yeah. Yep. Oh, the, like the user base security that I showed. Yeah. Yeah, so I, um, this workbook will be published. Okay. So you'll be able to actually see those calcs and how it's set so you can reverse engineer it. Does that work for you? Absolutely. Okay, you. yeah. And with all this, you guys will be able to take it and reverse engineer it if you found it useful. Okay. Question? Where do you split it down into the individual and the So we pull all of, we pull data out of Workday to be able to um, do a, run all of our dashboards. So right now we're, we have a people warehouse of that data and we're pulling it weekly so we can do any sort of weekly, monthly, quarterly rates. Um, but I think my biggest insight is that I think of Tableau as that platform. So I, in most of these dashboards and combining data from Workday in addition to data from our other systems. So right now we're on Taleo for our recruiting system. We have Anaplan, we have our finance data. You know, we have spreadsheets. And so I think the biggest opportunity is thinking about Tableau as that platform to, to be able to do the analysis. Does that help? Or are you wondering how you pull data out of Workday? I think it's creating that, that data warehouse that allows you to do it. So pulling out all the fields that you want at the cadence that you want in order to do that analysis is kind of my key lesson. And then a lot of times we're pulling that, we're creating that warehouse with all the kind of basic generic information. And then when we want to pull in something that's more confidential, um, we can then add that report to it. Um, but in a lot of times, for example, I told a story last year where we didn't track our exit interview notes in Workday. So when we were asked questions like, okay, for each one of those terms that left for you know, career advancement or compensation, we weren't actually able to read those notes. And so a lot of times they would start a questioning, well, is that really why they left? 
And without being able to pull in that information, we weren't able to answer that question. And so we've actually found that in a lot of cases we've updated our process in Workday or added new things in Workday to be able to capture that data so we can report on it. So that's probably another lesson learned there. Any other questions? We haven't, no. I am excited though, because I just hired an analyst who has a computer science background, and so I think we're, we'll work on tackling it over this next year. So ask me next year, and hopefully I'll have an answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. And then we're also gonna be starting a virtual user group for the HR community, and so look out for that coming, but with that, maybe we'll get examples of how other customers are doing it that we can share through that forum. Uh, we have looked at it, yes. It's, you know, so confidential. So um, I could whiteboard out how we've looked at it if you want to come up afterwards and kind of what we pulled in. Um, but I don't have any dashboards that I can share with you, but I can kind of talk through what we included um, and how we looked at it. Anything else? Well, I'll be up here if any of you had a question that you didn't want to ask in front of everyone. Um, and I'm also happy to connect um, afterwards with any one of you. So thank you.